think I'm damaged goods. I'm worried about losing my job. Will I ever get a transplant? I want to see my children graduate from college. How can I afford this? I don't want to be a burden. I'm afraid. I'm overwhelmed with information. Sometimes I wonder if I'll ever fall in love and get married. I just want to play with my friends. You're listening to Kidney Talk, streaming health, happiness, and hope to the renal community with your hosts, Lori Hartwell and Stephen First. And today I'm here with Susie Gonzalez, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that's like. I've certainly experienced it. She's going through it. So Susie, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So Susie, tell me a little bit about, you know, when you got your transplant. Um, and was it a deceased donor or, and how long were you on dialysis? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Uh, it was from a deceased donor about 10 years ago. Um, he was a man, uh, 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 he was 57 years old. And actually I had kidney failure at 19 and uh, this was my second transplant. And, but my first one was back when I was 24, which really didn't work. So then I had to go back on dialysis. And how long were you on dialysis? Um, Altogether, it was about 15 years. 15 years. And so when you got this transplant, how long have you had this transplant? 10 years. 10 years. Yes. And what was that like, you know? I mean, when did it start working and was it pretty immediate? Yeah, it was. It was immediate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you've been... um, transplanted for 10 years. And when did you come to find out that things were kind of changing for you? I would say in the last, um, and according to all my tests also, in the last maybe two years, um, maybe a year before, in the last two years, but um, certainly the year before last. (laughs) Um, I, I I was having some swelling and I was tired. I was teaching at the time and, um, and working a lot also. And um, so I, but then the doctor also told me about a year year and about maybe 15 months ago that the kidney, that I was losing the kidney. So it was puttering out. I like to use the word puttering. It was puttering. Yes, it was. And it's still puttering along. So what's your GFR now? It's 18. And you were telling me earlier that your GFR was 13. 14. 14. Mm -hmm. And you know, it is I've experienced the same thing because I had my transplant for 20 years and it's puttering out. I had to start dialysis in March and I'm hoping to get another transplant after 20 years of having a transplant. But it was the same thing. The cycle of of the transplant the last couple of years, I just started to get symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, so... You know, you first see your ankle swelling, your blood pressure rising, needing more EPO. Uh, But I don't know about you, but I had a way of just, you know, kind of denying that it wasn't happening. Like, oh, no, this can't be happening. Did you feel that way? Well, um, after the doctor told me that I was losing the kidney, um, it actually, I I didn't go into denial right away. It's like, okay, I understood what was going on. And, um, and so I did have to inc- uh, start taking EPO eventually, and my blood pressure was going up. I had to increase my, me- my blood pressure medications. But then um, I, I, w- I knew I was in denial because I knew I was, <laughs> I started abusing my diet when it came to high phosphorus foods. I was eating lots of burritos, bean burritos, mm-hmm. and my phosphorus did go up. And so I was experiencing itching and all this sort of thing. And I knew I wasn't supposed to be doing this, but I was doing it anyways. Well, you know, one of the things that is about phosphorus foods is it's comfort food. Everything, you know, macaroni and cheese, ice cream. And I mean, um, that's one of the things I found is that cheese and dairy products, when you don't feel good, that's what you want to eat. Oh, well. I don't know if you experienced that, but um, other than just loving Mexican food. but (laughs) Well, both. I love Mexican food and I wasn't feeling that great. You're right. And did you see your blood pressure go up? And yes. did you have to, yeah? Yes. The same thing. And you have to get that all under control because, you know, once you get it under control, you can actually help your kidney transplant. Mm, I, mm-hmm, I believe that. I think you're right. As a matter of fact, my, I, my GFR, you know, obviously got a lot better from 14 to 18. I, had, I experienced, um, well, they, had a, they changed the medications. And then uh, also I did start taking care of myself a lot better. So what are you doing to help 
you know, your mental state. I mean, because for me, I have different coping strategies. I love creative things. Um, Of course, I have been supported by patients. There's this one gentleman, his name is Ed Spence, and I will possibly be getting my fourth transplant and you're going to be getting your third transplant. Well, he's had five. Oh my gosh. And he is doing wonderful. And, you know, that gives me so much hope because it shows you that you can get through this hurdle again, get back to your or independence where you don't need dialysis. and Right. Uh, but we're lucky that dialysis is here as a transition. I, but what are some of your coping skills? Well, volunteering, actually. I had to, uh, I felt like I needed to create um, a reason to go on living. And I wanted to create meaning in my life because I, I wasn't able to work like I was before. So I became an ambassador for Donate Life. And um, something that met, um, that's something that was very special to me. And then also I discovered RSN and renal support network and I needed the support and that's the reason why I came to the first support group meeting I found out through a friend and I came and I I said I need this (laughs) (laughs) and now I volunteer for renal support and I really enjoy it and I love the people here so I'm really in you know I've created meaning in my life again and um, so I feel like you know I have hope again, and a reason to go on. And I look forward to having my third transplant. Well, you know, one friend makes a difference because it's really interesting when you have all these new symptoms that you experience for the first time and it hits your body and you only have a couple of minutes to talk to your doctor or your nurse. I mean, you can talk to patients like, oh, I had that. This is what it is. This is what you do. This is what you ask your doctor. And it just gives you a sense of control that there's something you can do. I know for me, when I don't feel like there's anything I can do, I feel so powerless and I feel hopeless. I mean, I want to I want to do something to help myself. And so other people who have experienced this have helped me immensely. And I know that we met a while ago. Mm hmm. And we were kind of both in the same stage. I was ahead of you of needing dialysis. And so, you know, you've had the experience of seeing me start dialysis. And that's probably frightening and a load of starting dialysis, you know, just giving in. But, But I do have to say, I did feel better. It got rid of the fluid. It got rid of a lot of the things that I was kind of like, you know, dealing with up until the end. And that's one of the things that, you know, we hear a lot is that patients wait too long and they crash into dialysis. Oh, wow. And they are so sick, it then makes it more difficult, especially if you're getting transplant. It could delay that um, process. Oh, oh, well, yeah, yeah, I don't want to wait until I'm like really sick (laughs) because um, I want to continue, you know, volunteering and keeping busy. And I want a smooth transition when I do start dialysis. That's what I'm hoping for. So we'll see how it goes. So far, so good, though. What um, treatment option are you going to choose? I'm going to go in-center hemodialysis. That's what I'll be doing. And you were on PD for a long time, I was, for five years. Uh And is there a reason, you know, I'm a big PD advocate. Well, Um, I I love PD. And I'm I'm actually on home hemo right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, because I'm trying to get transplanted, i got some other things going on that I need to um, take care of. uh, But peritoneal was my uh, modality of choice. Um, and it w- was it yours? It was. It actually was because um, years ago when I was on PD, when I first started, it, it, it really changed my life and it gave me a lot of control in my life. And I enjoyed it. I was my own uh, nurse and uh, I could take care of myself. So yeah, it, PD worked for me. But this time around, I developed a hernia and I didn't realize that the hernia had to be repaired months or maybe even a year before a PD catheter could be placed. And um, thinking, I told the doctor, oh, well, when you put the PD in catheter, can you please fix the hernia? He says, what? You have a hernia? (laughs) And I said, yeah. (laughs) Can you do both? He says, "Uh, no. (laughs) So I had to get the hernia fixed and uh, and which would not heal for another year. And so they thought that I was going to be needing uh, dialysis sooner than a year. So I had to go um, on hemo just in case and, and have and a, get a fistula and get a fistula put in my arm. But you're not on hemo yet. Not yet. Not and yet. Hopefully you won't be. Well, now, are you, um, so your hopes is to get another transplant? Yes. I, I'm actually, I just currently got on the list about two weeks ago. So I'm on the active list now. And I think that's something that, 
people need to know is that if you are in the stage you need to get on the transplant list, I think you can qualify to get on the transplant list when your GFR is under 20. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. And you really need dialysis when your GFR is under 15 to 10 for diabetics and 10, you know, somewhere in there. I mean, I went to about uh, 10. GFR because I'm not diabetic. And, you know, that's really up to your doctor and you, but that's kind of a guideline. So you can hang out. Um, I was at an 18, 19 GFR for a couple of years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's why it's so important to get listed because you could potentially get transplanted and get a preemptive transplant, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I've met some people who've had preemptive transplants and I tried to get a preemptive transplant, but I was not successful in getting that uh, um, accomplished. But it's a, it's a great avenue for us if, um, if you can get ahead of the game and get listed. Right, right. That, well, I hope for that and uh, maybe even a possible live donor. So we'll see what happens with that. I know it is kind of um, my last three donors are, were all deceased donors. And I had my first transplant at age 13, my second one at 17, and my third one at age, I was about 24. And they were all deceased donors. And, you know, I'm so grateful. It was amazing. My last deceased donor um, was a, a male in, in his middle 20s who was in an accident. And, you know, in Denver, it was a perfect match. And this kidney is still working. It's over 20 years. But now it looks like I'm going to probably, you know, most likely get a live donor. And it's a different experience because, you know, you have people coming up and saying, want to donate a kidney to you. And it's just like, what do you say? Oh, my gosh. And, you know, what do you, how do you let people know? And it's a really interesting you know, dynamic because you don't want people to feel obligated because yeah. you're around them. And then people right. offer, it, it's the craziest feeling. I mean, it, I've never been, you know, through this before. Mm -hmm. And so right. uh, hopefully, you know, I'll be lucky enough to get a, a live donor because the transplant lists seven to nine years here. Right. And I certainly don't want to be on dialysis that long if I can avoid it. And, you know, now I'll have the person that I can invite to birthday parties. Oh, that would I mean, be. all the different things are going to be a new member of the family, yeah. whoever it is. It's just kind of a, a surreal feeling, but just amazing that people want to give this gift I of think, life. I think it's amazing also. Yes, it is. I, it is. And I mean, what's so weird is the people that have approached me, they're like, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to give this gift this kidney or I want to at least be tested. I'd like to do this. And it's like what you went back is, you know, people want meaning. They want to make a difference. And, you know, I guess at this point I have to read the last chapter of my book, Chronically Happy, you know, take help, give help. Now it's time for me to take help mm -hmm. because I need it. Um, and because I certainly feel better with a transplant. I mean, you know, it's when you have a working transplant. I was on dialysis for 12 years before this little run. Mm -hmm. it, it makes a big difference on how you feel when you have a working transplant. I, yeah, I, I don't look forward to going back on dialysis. But, <laughs> this but, is such a weird topic, isn't I, it? It is, but, you know, it, it's an option. It's, a, it's, you know, so it's there for us. Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting is that when you start to get the fluid on you, you actually like, oh, just take this fluid off because it becomes difficult to breathe. Your ankles are swollen, you know, and you're really doing damage to your body. So at a certain point, and then you get that taste in your mouth where um, it's like a, can you describe that taste? A, like a metal taste. Like a metal taste. Or so even bitter. Food doesn't taste or, good. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, dialysis does help a lot with that. And a transplant helps even more, a working one. But after a while, and, and the thing that's so confusing about this is the chronicity. Did you, did you feel the chronicity of the illness? It just slowly, you slowly start to feel better, but you can't pinpoint exactly when you started to feel bad. Uh, you're right. Um, that is true. I knew I was having uh, symptoms a long time ago, but um, <laughs> I didn't even realize my kidney was failing until the doctor actually told me. And then I thought about it, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then, then, of course, I started really paying attention to the symptoms, my blood pressure going up, uh, and the fluid in my ankles and, and the swelling. I could see it in my face also. And so, yeah. So what are you doing to try to sustain your existing kidney function uh, on a daily basis? On a daily basis. Well, uh, 
I, I'm definitely trying to make sure I drink water, um, enough water per day, but also my diet is a huge factor, I think, in taking care of myself. Um, not, not eating, overeating too much protein. I'm trying to stay away from um, red meats. I notice if I eat a hamburger, a small hamburger, my feet get swollen immediately. So I'm, stay, I'm trying to stay away from red meats and, um, and sticking to, you know, six ounces per day of protein and, uh, and also low sodium foods. And because I do have big problem with blood pressure. And so it, it really does affect my blood pressure. And I know that affects the kidney. So um, I really try to stick to low sodium foods also. And it's been working. I mean, my blood pressure has been under control. Although, you know, occasionally, you know, I do cheat. <laughs> so it's hard not it's to. through trial and error. That's how I've discovered that, you know, oh, I can't eat that. My feet have got swollen, you know, or my blood pressure went up when I ate that. I better not eat that Can't again. Can't you feel it like going to your face when you're eating it after a while? Like you could feel it going, the sodium going to your head when you're eating something, you know, that has a lot of salt in it. And you're not quite sure because it's hidden salt. And then you can feel your body swelling like an hour after you've eaten it. That is true. You're right. You do feel the swelling immediately. But I sometimes I get like a little headache. I actually get a little headache and then it'll go away. But then hours later, I get a bad headache, like at night. And that's when my blood pressure goes up is at night or in the middle of the night. One of the things that I think is interesting is it's really about being in tune with your body. Mm -hmm, that's true. I, I mean, you really have to get to know your body. And I had a new symptom lately. I've been getting little bouts of gout. Have you oh, ever had gout? No, I don't think so. No. Oh, my goodness. Well, when you get high um, uremic acid. Okay. It can just crystallize in your toe or, oh. well, it's funny. It was in my ankle. Uh -huh. I thought I had sprained my ankle and oh. I went to the orthopedic doctor and the uh -huh. gout arthritis, uh, gouty arthritis. Uh-huh. And, you know, having kidney disease for 42 years, I mean, a lot of people get gout. And <laughs> I, I went to the orthopedic doctor thinking I had sprained my ankle. And it basically it was gout, and they usually take it away with, you know, an injection of steroids or, you know, some kind of medication. Uh, and it's just it basically gets so inflamed, but it feels like it's the most painful thing I've ever experienced. Oh, you're kidding. And I recently had it again, but it was on the top of my feet. And I thought I had like smashed my foot or something. And, you know, you take some gout medication, it's gone like in a day or so. But uh, not that I'm trying to, you know, show you, but until I talked to other patients and they told me like, wow, this goes away. I get it all the time. It's just a symptom. And it's... Uh, I did it's, not know um, this. You know, I have to tell you, I'm experiencing pain now, and I went to the doctors for it in my back and on my knee, and maybe that's what I have. It, it, I actually spoke to a nurse yesterday about it, and because I'd never had it. I had it on the top of my feet. I felt like I was in Vegas last weekend. I thought, God, I didn't burn the top of my feet. I couldn't even put my shoe, like a shoe sandal over the top of it and like walking. And I thought, well, maybe I stretched my foot during dialysis. You know how you stretch or you do that. And maybe I pulled a muscle on the top or something. And that's what was making it so painful. And um, it was gout. I took some medication last night. I woke up, don't have the pain this morning. And when I was talking to Mark, uh, he said that, uh, yeah, gout can show up absolutely anywhere. And, uh, um, mm. you know, and I've gotten it in like my toe and uh -huh. the side of my is, foot. Is there any kind of burning with it? Or? It is just, yeah, it's a burning. It's just it's painful. It's, it can be a little red. Uh, we actually have an article about it on kidney times, but it's a strange thing because it's, you can feel the pain and you don't know if you've like stubbed your toe or. Is there a blood test they can tell or, or Yeah, something? they can tell if you're, if it's, uh, it's, your acid is too high. Oh. There's a certain acid that gets too high. And so that's what happens. You know, it's a lot of transplant patients get this. And I was pretty lucky. I only had it a couple of times when I had a transplant and, uh, but you know, a couple times too many, <laughs> but it is, it's something, you know, we have to learn because, you know, here I am running off to the orthopedic doctor thinking I sprained my ankle and he's like, you know, you got gouty arthritis in your ankle and he injected a little bit of steroids in it. But I mean, I probably could have, it was so painful. I couldn't even walk. I had to use a crutch and oh, I just woke up that way. Oh, wow. 
and they give you the medication and it goes away. It's it's amazing mm -hmm. um, that, you know, you can have something that works so quickly. But it's awful when you're on vacation or something and it just, I know the definition now of a gout attack. You hear these gout attacks. Yes, I've heard of that. <laughs> and that's what I had, a oh. gout attack. Oh, um, yeah, that sounds anyways, very painful. So, you know, we have to know our bodies and, you know, learn how to... Uh, to adjust to it and figure out, you know, how to be our advocate so we can pinpoint what we need to have, you know, hmm. to take care of ourselves. Because we're not always seeing a doctor that frequently when we're before uh, we have a transplant. How often do you see your doctor? You know, I, I'm surprised that I don't see him more often. I only see him about every two months. And that's about it. And I, so I do the blood work also about every two months. And, I, and sometimes I get a little worried. You yeah, know, like I, it's my potassium too high. Yeah, oh, exactly. My potassium or I'm like, okay, my phosphorus has got to be high. I'm itching, you know, or I'm wondering what, what's going on sometimes. But um, the reason why I think I may have gout also is, be, well, not only because of the pain, but because I do have a problem with acid in my system. And the doctor has told me to take bisodium carbonate morning and night. And it also helps me to feel better. But I didn't realize that having acid in your system can lead to gout. You know, I, I definitely am going to talk to my doctor about this, or and I need to be checked for that then, because um, I certainly have been experiencing some symptoms that could be gout. It could be. And that's one of the things, is that it just shows up, and then it goes away, and then it shows up, and then it goes away, and it's, it's very um, misleading um, symptom. So, you know, these are all the little things, but um, I guess to wrap it up, Susie, mm -hmm. so tell us what, you know, what, what you enjoy doing and what you're doing to stay busy other than volunteering with RSN and... Well, um, I used to play a lot of tennis. Yesterday, I, I took my racket to be restrung. So I'm going to get back into playing tennis, and I do enjoy going out dancing. <laughs> I love to dance. So at least once or twice a week, I try and get out and go dancing in the evenings with my friends. And um, I do watch a lot of TV. I probably watch too much TV. And uh, just maybe sometimes getting together with my family, and we have dinner or that sort of thing. But basically, it's keeping yourself busy because right now you need to keep your mind into the best possible state that it can be because it's all about, you know, trying to look at the glass half full, isn't it? Yes, I agree. I agree. Staying positive and um, always trying not to get depressed or, you know, because... can always be worse, can it? It can be, always be worse. Yes, that's true. Well, great. Well, I thank you for for being on Kidney Talk and thank you for all your help to RSN. And oh, you know, sure. thank you for talking about this difficult subject. You know, so many people that I know have, have been transplanted more than once. And it's probably because of my experience here 40 years. You now know a lot of people. But, you know, it's so tough when you're going through it. I mean, it's like you're a brand new patient again. You know, you're experiencing it. Just because I was on dialysis many years ago doesn't mean you can avoid all the emotions yeah. that come with it. So, or, or getting used to being stuck with needles. Or that. just, yeah, or just all the, you know, medication changes and side effects. And um, I know when I was going, when I'm going through this transition, uh, you know, I still had to go through all the emotions, the shock, denial, the fear, the anger, the depression, the grief and understanding acceptance. And I think I, you know, fall back into, you know, anger. What is it? What is, why do I have to go through this again? And then, you know, you bounce around and you really need to connect with others who understand because they've helped me and you've helped me. Oh, quite, I, quite I, honestly, over the last couple months of just getting through this transition because it's, you know, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Oh, and good. That's, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> and that's really, you know, what it's about is, you know, knowing that you're not alone in this transition. There's a lot of help out there. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been wonderful knowing you, Lori. And um, you certainly have given me a lot to a lot of hope also and uh, a lot of support. And I want to thank you for that. We can control our own destiny. We can take charge of our health and ask questions about our medical options. We can form partnerships with our health care team. We can take steps towards self-improvement. We can be sensitive to the impact of our disease on our family. We can sing, dance, laugh, and enjoy our lives. We can appreciate today and look forward to tomorrow. We can help and support our fellow patients. We can pursue our hopes and dreams. We can make a difference. 